What we have here is a failed shower pan. So I'm gonna do a shower pan redo. Uh, the shower pan redo I do probably once in a year, sometimes twice in a year. But I'm gonna go through the process of explaining a shower pan redo and the history behind this. I think this house, um, if I'm not mistaken, they did a renovation, so says the homeowner before they moved out my homeowner is brand new to the house but the house is probably plus 10 12 years old and we don't think this was the builder's grade we think that me and the homeowner think that uh, this was a redo uh, for the purposes of making it prettier and all that stuff which it probably was given the fact that builder's grade tile never really looks good um, i'm not really too hip on the brass but for some reason it is coming back in style uh, but getting to the issue, another thing too, if you notice this curb is only, uh, two, two by fours high. In fact, I think this is a two by six. It might be, no, it's two, two by fours. Um, so it's kind of a short two inches on the inside. We're going to try and keep that. Um, the glass has already been taken out is sitting in the other room over here until the glass company puts it back. But there are three panels of glass. Well, two panels and a door that have to go in there. Um, the, the weird thing is that they actually drilled into the curb. And here in Metro Atlanta, I've never seen glass guys drill into the curb. Because the panel is so heavy and because it's caulked on both sides of the wall and all that stuff, that it's not going anywhere. So to have the clamp and a clamp going into the curb isn't necessary. Um, they did a quite, a bit, quite a bit of caulking around that clamp. So... Almost without a doubt, the leak is not coming from there. Uh, almost without a doubt. We don't know where the leak is coming from. It is downstairs somewhere. Uh, downstairs is an open basement concept. There's no, there's nothing, you can see everything. So it's very evident that this whole area around the drain, the plywood, the OSB as it were, um, is all dry. However, over in this area downstairs, there's a stain on the OSB. So my take on it is that it's coming somewhere from this area. Um, it's very doubtful, as I said, the screw heads, because again, you know, it's just caulked really, really well. And so I'm not suspecting that at all. The shower head is spraying over that direction and not over here. So yes, there's a little cracking going on between the grout because it was never caulked. Um, but caulking is not a waterproofer. So the shower is definitely failing from within, from within somewhere, and we don't know where. Um, it's not around the drain. Yeah. But overall, I'm uh, just going to go on a little. So when I go into a shower, let's say this didn't fail. Let's say that there was a bunch of screw-ups going on. There's a bunch of lippage or a bunch of things going on and the homeowner did not want the shower anymore, right? Then I would come in here with my little mm, dissertation, <laughs> long dissertation on how well they did tile. And when I came in here the first time to come and give the estimate, I'm like, wow, not, not too bad, not too shabby. You know, there's a lot of things that I look for to see if this guy was a tiler, uh, a shower installer, which sometimes are not part and parcel of each other. See that tile? That's one full 24 inch tile and see how he cut it to like 18 or 19 and then put the other three inches over there. And he did the same thing over here to make one full tile. He did it all the way down. So I like that. I like the symmetry, you know, like even cut there, even cut there, like the symmetry, even the bull nose, you know, like you would take that for granted, right? You would just say, well, duh, but a lot of guys won't do that. I like the symmetry of that cut back there. I, I would have preferred a solid surface rather than tile, but that's just me. But overall, that's not bad. I mean, it's really not bad. I don't think that's a foam bench because I've never seen that shape of a foam bench. So when I get into cutting out uh, the bottom row, I'm gonna have to cut into that bench and um, see how things are done over there. 
Um, but overall, overall, it's it's very nice. The only issue, the only real big issue, which is kind of big to me, is there's a lot of lippage on this bottom. Like the top is very smooth and flush, all the way, all the way, all the way across until we get to here. And then there's some very, very deep lippage. But the lippage is even deeper here. Like I'm gonna say a, almost a quarter of an inch. I mean, you can clearly see, you know, the factory edge going around and over here too. It's, it's bumped out pretty well. So I'm gonna assume this guy, um, either he, he hadn't built a lot of showers or he's never built a shower. Um, and I'm gonna go for the latter because we have a leak, right? So we have a leak. He could be an excellent tile guy where it comes to bathroom floors and it comes to backsplashes in the kitchen. Um, excellent tile guys, symmetry, all the stuff that I talked about before, all of that stuff having been said, he's never done a shower because he's never really had to do a border and the border is messed up. Otherwise, it's not too bad. There's a little lippage. There's a little lippage going on here and there. Um, also, I think most tile guys, although he did put a slope in here, most tile guys would be adamantly opposed to having that sliver cut. You know, like that one inch sliver cut going around is not necessary. Yes, I know he used two and a quarter, two and a half inch bullnose and take, take up the difference, but you can make your own bullnose, right? Or you could, again, solid piece. It would be a solid piece that goes up here. You know, you can make your own bullnose out of one of these tile and have it the thickness you want. Or he could have wrapped it in Schluter, you know, or, or, or. There's a lot of different ways to skin that cat. But um, the symmetry is still good. You got the cut at the bottom, got the cut at the top, although that's cockeyed. Um, but overall, not bad. Not bad. He's a tile guy. Um, he's a relatively good tile guy. But I don't think he's built a shower. But I digress. That's not why I'm here. I am here to find out, as I've said on many videos in the past, I have to kill the patient to find the disease. So when somebody says, hey, my shower pan is leaking and they're trying to quick fix, right? They're trying to put caulking, they're trying to mitigate some of the cracks and all that stuff and put caulking and silicone and all that stuff. That is not your waterproofer. If you already have a leak, you already have damage. Somewhere there is damage. Somewhere there is a screw up that when they built the shower, they should not have done. And you cannot know that unless you had x-ray vision to find out what they did. In the rare cases where somebody's taken pictures, yes, but that's the rare case. The exception, not the rule. Otherwise, I gotta tear everything out. And when I start pulling this curb out, finding out if there's some type of uh, water penetration into the curb, if the pan liner has been perforated below where it should have, if the drain is leaking out, I don't know why the drain would leak out and not show it from down at the bottom because the stain is over here. Oh, by the way, when you have a shower pan leak and your ceiling is fully enveloped with sheetrock or even if you have a drop ceiling and you see water coming around your P-trap area from down below and the rest of it is plywood or OSB, don't be fooled and thinking it's a drain because it's never been the drain. Not my experience, it's never been the drain. So typically people call a plumber and they confirm it's not the drain, it's not the shower valve leaking from behind the wall, which in this case we know it's not. Um, and, and so the problem is usually emanating from the curb. Although he dropped down his, I think he, he curb tile first, but you know, it emanates from left and right of the curb and wicks its way down into the plywood and eventually, yeah, then you see it. But so what I have to do is I have to take out all the curb material. I have to take out one tile down, and in this case it's one tile in like three inches, all the way around, all the way around, all the way around. When I tear out all that material, including the pan, and all the pan material, I'm down to the studs here, and I'm down to the subfloor here, and pull all the curb out, which is why I took the glass out, then I can go forward with the build back and make it like it never happened. The problem is, you know, this was built, as I said, some years ago. They don't make this texture tile that we used to work with quite frequently back in the day. So I had to get something very similar. And in this case, it's 16 by 16, has a little texture on it. It sort of kind of blends with that. It won't be perfect, but it's the best we can do. And I got lucky because 16 by 16 is kind of odd. 
Um, and I need, that's what I need. I need 12, 13, 14, 15. I need about 15 inches. So that should work out very well. Uh, it's what my customer ended up picking after I got four or five different samples and drove all over town. Then we're doing this marble hexagon because hexagon is the in thing. We're gonna do that on the floor. When I build this back, it will be 100% waterproof and never have a failure again. Walls, yeah, they never, there's no problem with the walls. It's always the pan. I would say the ankle below. And in this case, literally, because <laughs> it's such a small curve, literally ankle below is where the failure is at. But I don't know the failure until I get into the process of tearing things out. And yeah, so I'll get started on that. All right, so the process of disassembling a shower pan, I usually start at the curb, mainly because I want to see what damage has done, was done during, uh, you know, how many years it was in place. And since the curb is almost always the Achilles heel, I always tear that apart first uh, to find out what's going on. And then I start at the walls and you will see that momentarily. Um, being very careful not to damage the outside floor because in most cases I don't have matching tile for either the floor, floor or the wall for that matter. And I'm going to get to that when we get to the wall area. But yeah, very, very, it, it's almost like um, a dissection, if you will. And although this is fast speed, I'm definitely taking my time and being careful not to, uh, to damage anything. I think in this case they actually set the floor um, after they, well they did the curb first and then they set the floor, same as the walls. And that's kind of back ass word and I was having some difficulty taking off the inside portion of this curb. But in this case and in almost every case that I've run into, uh, the curb was definitely the failure point and you will clearly see that later on. Uh, this is where I'm marking my parameter of my curb because where the glass was has to go back exactly. So anytime you put, um, when you're redoing the walls and the curb and all that stuff, the glass has to go back. As a general rule, um, frameless glass has to go back. In order for that to happen, uh, the measurement has to be taken left to right front to back. All those measurements have to be taken prior to knocking things out. Because if you don't, your glass won't fit. Uh, in this particular instance, the glass will fit because my parameters are pretty wide open. Um, not having um, a top end and only going up, I think, uh, barely, not even one tile. Because those tile on the left and, and left and right on the vertical or bull nose, so I just have to follow that and I'm okay. But if you're off uh, even an eighth of an inch, that glass will never fit back, so make sure you do your markings ahead of time. Here I'm just kind of disseminating uh, some of the failure points, and also uh, you'll see a little bit later on, and it's fast speed. You can slow it down if you want. There's a toggle on YouTube where you can slow it down, but I'm I'm kind of weirding out about some of this uh, moist material that I'm taking off of the curb. It's as it's if they used, uh, there is a premixed thin set, and the premixed thin set, for all intents and purposes, is like a mastic. It'll never dry. And even if it does dry, if there's some, well, somewhat, if there's some moisture content, which there definitely was in this curb, then it always stays wet. And that's what I ran into as I was taking these pieces out. I'm like, how come there's some wetness on here? What is this? Is this grout that never dried or is it thin set or, or what? And it was hard to tell because, as I said, there was so much water penetration into the curb that um, it could have been anything. You see here how the floor tile didn't really adhere. Yeah, so as I go forward with uh, knocking out the wall tile, I always start from the bottom and work my way up to that grout line. Um, it's imperative that you don't 
damage any tile that's above what you're trying to take out because uh, as I said there's no matching tile for that next row so I can't chip or damage or crack uh, the joining tile and usually that grout line will give you a little buffer so um, that's why I kind of start at the bottom and work up to that grout line and then you know even little small tiny pieces you know I'm just pulling off and being careful not to damage any any of the above tile because you will not have a good day if you start knocking out tile that you can't replace and in this case uh, I didn't have any to replace so yeah it would not have been good so just be very careful and take your time knocking out that bottom row of tile don't don't try and take out the wallboard with it you know just stick to the tile itself and it gets messy and wear gloves as I'm not doing here because these tile are very very sharp and they will cut you and I'm gonna move on to talking about the tear out right about here all right so I've gotten the curb out I probably talked in the previous video I probably put me blabbing in the previous video is a lot easier for me to do it that way but I am back so there's some things going on that you probably saw there is a um, not even 80 percent or 85 or 90 percent coverage maybe on that tile and that's about it but there is not much coverage on this tile at all at all which has nothing to do with the leak but my take on it, without going any further, my take on it is a couple of things. Um, putting tile inside of this void, right? You do your wall tile first, and then you do your floor tile, is wrong, wrong, wrong in so many ways. See that? So you leave that void, and having that void in there, water, will, it's a channel for water. I've seen it time and time and again when I take out showers, so bad idea to do that, bad idea there's a lot of things I could talk about one of the good things is that they didn't set their wall board on top of the pan which is good so the wall board didn't whip up water but that is never really the spot where water penetrates they focused in over here they used, a, um, they used red guard red guard also has these dam corners um, they're rubber type of membrane that wrap around the corners because everybody knows that's usually the failure so yes, they wrap around the corners with these and I don't use them because all of my wall board is waterproof. The wall board is waterproof as is the curb and they kind of half-ass waterproof the curb. I'm going to get to that. Um, say they even use a scab piece of this material because they ran out or they cut their pan liner wrong or whatever so they scabbed in this corner piece of that same rubber material to kind of mitigate the issues but the issues still happen as you can clearly see this is rusted and as you saw before there's some water penetration there's moisture going on they kind of had a, a little bit of an idea what to do but then but then they didn't um, you saw how easily the tiles came up uh, because this mat they never really pushed it down into the thin set, so the tiles came up relatively easily. Um, the thin set has barely even seen the bottom of the tile. You see where they screed it out, thin set, but then never really attached it. Uh, and then there's some red guard here, but it doesn't appear that they red guarded the entirety of the pan. They only did it around this area and kind of half assed it around the curb. They, 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 they wanted to do the right thing, which is why they use those corners and why they fashioned that in. But then look what they did. They ended up going through the pan liner with their fasteners and then they didn't butter out and waterproof the top of the curb, you know? So that's a lot of the problem too. But my take on it is this is not the failure, even though there was some moisture and there was still years later, there was still some wet 
I think caulking. I thought it was thin set, and it might be thin set because some of that pre-mixed thin set will never dry out properly. I don't know where it's at now, but when I took a piece out, it was clearly still wet. And even though these guys just moved in, they never used a shower because they knew from day one it was leaking. So they stopped using it. I don't know where that piece is now. This is the top of the curb. So they didn't really, they, I don't see any buttering of the curb, right? You see the red guard in between, sandwiched in between the thin set and the backer board, but they never buttered the backer board. They just red guarded on top of it, which in my mind would be an uh, incorrect way to do it. Yeah. It's a shame that it had to fail like this. You could see the water penetration. You could see the staining on the backer board. So the curb is definitively uh, wet and will never really dry out. And it would have caused more of a problem onto the soap floor eventually as water just wicked out and made its way down to the subfloor. There would have been more problem. So yeah, there are a lot of a lot of um, incorrect ways of building this even though like I said they tried really hard so you see how I, I beat out the bottom uh, tile first and work my way up so that I'm not you know like potentially chipping the edges of those tiles and that's kind of the way that I take out you know that bottom row spot bonding never a good idea and very very thick you know, like very, very thick. Yeah. I don't know, folks. I don't know. You know, every job has its operator malfunction. I keep those bull nose because those are scrap bull nose. I never saved any one, but I, I might need some of those pieces later, so I keep those. You see, there's no thin set on the floor tile, there's no adhesion going on which is irrelevant to the leak i'm just saying definite water intrusion yeah let me get back to the floor now and see what else i can find all right folks here is where we get in all right folks this is where we get into the fun part um they had actually set the backer board into the pan which made it more difficult even more difficult to take out the pan material so I was relegated to take out the wall material first which I usually do last but um, in this case I had to so I'm sorry about that ran into a microphone malfunction um, as I was saying before I so rudely interrupt interrupted myself um, sometimes sawzall sometimes uh, skill saw oscillating tool uh, a lot of things are used to take the wallboard out but know this there could be and I've seen it before plumbing electrical HVAC all kinds of things behind the wall so if you're gonna do uh, a dissection of your wall material which you're gonna have to do if you do a shower pan redo then ensure please ensure that there is no wall there's nothing behind that wall as you're taking all this material out um, and a lot of people ask me, well, how do I make the transition from the new wallboard to the old wallboard when you're taking it out and doing a shower pan redo? It's pretty simple. You're getting the cut, like I'm showing here, very, very close to the tile. And then you put the new wallboard in and have a straight edge on it. A straight edge meaning the wallboard is cut nicely. And then you just butt that up against the old wallboard and then you fill it in with some thin set. Uh, red guard over that and you're good to go so it's not very complicated really isn't be careful with uh, hammering as I'm doing here and the flat pry bar which you will need uh, the flat pry bar works pretty good on pulling out your old wallboard in this case I had a cement wallboard material um, that made it a little more difficult than if it were any other wallboard but yeah be careful because 
you're going to have a bad day if you start chipping the tile that you cannot replace above it. And that grout line uh, will facilitate, will help a lot uh, because that grout line will be a buffer between your top tile. But as I said in the previous clip where I'm taking out the tile, I start at the bottom. In this case, I'm starting at the top, obviously. And that oscillating tool will chip and damage the joining tile if you're not careful. So, you know, be careful. And you see here I'm changing my blade a couple of times. What I didn't realize, there I'm changing my blade. What I didn't realize at the time is that bench is solid cinder block. I think there's either two or three pieces of cinder block that make up that bench, which I wasn't aware of until I started getting into it. Which is crazy because, you know, like benches aren't normally made of cinder block. And as it turned out, at the end of the day, my customer decided that they didn't want that bench there anyway, which was great for me. That was a floating bench, and I'll get into that uh, talk later in the video, meaning that they had done the walls and they had done the floor and all that stuff, and then set that center block on top of it, which precluded me from taking out all the pan material later on um, when I got up to the edge of the bottom of that bench with the pan material I realized that the pan material was under the bench and then thankfully because it was a floating bench it just pulled right out and you'll see that later too that grout line that you see at the top of the bench was the only thing holding it in place the only anchoring that it had uh, beside the bottom and beside the, the sheer weight of it um, here I'm taking out the pan material so get a five pound sledge uh, to knock out lines in your mortar. That's the easiest way to go. Sometimes a mortar is girthier and how would I put it? Um, it's not, the pan material itself is made up of different mortar products and you never know which one you're dealing with, but a very high PSI type of mortar that has dried and cured really well over the years is more difficult to get up and in that case I would get out my jackhammer and then you know again knock it out in sections because you're not going to get out um, very large chunks I'm always happy when I do but sometimes I have to break those down into smaller ones um, in order to get it out the door what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to get a line uh, a crease if you will a crack to happen between uh, the two sections of that mortar because that one piece is too difficult to get out and there you see the crack happening and then I'm able to facilitate getting those into two different sections it's never an easy process unless the mortar is really degraded and the mortar is like wet then it becomes a lot easier but once once it's you know gone past years and years of setting and it's not wet um, if it was done correctly anyway then it's more difficult to get out but you know just take your time on it there's no harm no foul and I think there's a is a repeat of this little clip and my apologies for that on the editing end of it but that allows me more time to talk and give little hints and all that stuff you see where the mortar bed was like clearly under the bench that really messed me up that messed up my whole day yeah so here's the repetitive part so what I didn't talk about and I want to I want to talk about you see there's no tape or anything on the top of that drain and that's intentional um, I don't generally tape off the top of the drain the main reason being is that I'm usually taking out the drain material I'm taking out uh, the p-trap and because of that I already know that anything that drops in the drain I'm not too concerned about the main reason I take out the P-trap on every job, uh, redo job that I do, because I don't know how much of the gunk that the other contractor threw down the drain, and usually it's pretty pervasive. There's mortar, there's thin set, there's grout, all kinds of things clogging up that drain. So, although it might still drain, it might drain slowly. I've seen some drains that are two inches that have maybe you you might be able to get a sharpie down the drain I mean that's how clogged up they are and so for that reason alone um, I usually swap out the p-trap just beyond where the p-trap begins under the floor 
and so for that reason I'm not concerned about getting things into the drain because the drain will be deleted as will this bench later on and I'll talk about that a little bit later my customer decided they didn't want the bench anyway which is great for me but that bench weighed uh, I had to knock that bench into like three different pieces in order to get it out the door because they encapsulated the drain with with mortar and thin set and all kinds of stuff that bench whew, Dorothy and Toto would be proud of but I ended up replacing it with a um, with a shelf mm, well we used to use shelves back in the day before niches and um, she wanted something to shave her legs on and did not want the bench anyway it took up a lot of room in the shower so I was able All right, all the pan material is gone. Uh, a little clearer vision on how they made this happen. I don't like those corners they made. They're really not doing much good. Well, up the wall maybe, but I don't know. Like I said, I don't believe in them because I believe when you get to that point, if water gets there, you've already failed the shower. I don't think they replicated it. They didn't replicate it over here where the shower head is at. Hmm. Anyway. Houston, we have a problem. A couple of problems. Um, yeah, they didn't waterproof the pan. It was ridiculous to waterproof all of this if the pan wasn't waterproof because the water's going to wake up and all do what it does. Um, you can see clearly they put the bottom flange on top of the um, subfloor. But I've talked about pre slopes before. That's where your pre slope would have started have those bolts been sitting on top and um, we don't do water in water out systems anymore so it was kind of well that's kind of stupid it should have been like a taper cut to match up the taper cut of the bottom flange anyway here's the problem they made the bench out of cinder block not only that but it was almost an afterthought you see that so they clearly put tile on the wall all the way around both sides on the wall up to this point here well all the way down actually all the way down on the wall then then when the pan was poured they put cinder block on top of the plant three cinder block and did 45 cuts on the cinder block to match up but they did a really bad job to match them up so there's three cinder blocks sitting upward i don't know what's on top it's a floating bench because now that I've taken out the mortar, that mortar I can't take out because it's part of the bench. This actually separated from the wall because I could pull, I could literally pull this whole bench away from the wall. Conversely, I can kind of put it back. So I'm going to let my customer decide on that. Um, they just glued this backer board, literally like used thin set to the backer board, which is going to make it really, really hard. To scrape all this crap off um totally unnecessary totally unnecessary but whatever um so what i could do is i could go out maybe about four inches with my pan liner cut and then yeah then overlap my next pan liner on top of that and then i will have something that's monolithic going off all the way up and then keep the bench in place prop it back up the way it was see that prop it back up the way it was and then leave it in place or just delete the bench altogether which is preferable to me but it's not my shower look at this this is a when you do outside corners like this it's very hard to wrap pan liner around and they ran into that same issue um, wrapping pan liner and getting the folds and not making cuts is very very difficult outside corners so that's why I don't use when I have a pan like this I use curdy curdy is much easier to manipulate and scab in some pieces retroactively um, yeah I use curdy as my pan liner because it is waterproof I'm not gonna have the right driver of course I do. I got everything. I'm Bob the Builder. But I think these bolts are 
no toast. It is so rusted. This pan was um, saturated. All right. These bolts are rusted beyond anything I can do. So, cowboy spur, aka inside pipe cutter. Run that down. This is three inches. Run that down about two, just past the transition. You can cut it out from the inside. Then, oh, that's a horrible one. Oh, folks. the drain with the rusted bolts and we're putting a new drain in anyway and there you go easy peasy so the next phase is to do the blocking which I've already pre-cut all these pieces go in horizontally between the studs Obviously, they didn't do it before, which is another reason that I know he doesn't build showers. Is it absolutely necessary? Mm, it's arguable. You know, the pan liner kind of dips in between the studs, and I've never liked that, so I've been doing that for years and years. Is it necessary now? Yes, because I'm going to be using a fleece cloth membrane. Usually, I use Curdy. This stuff is a little thicker, and I think I like it more. It's fleeced on both sides also. And so that's good for my mortar when I put my mortar in. Um, I always, I always um, waterproof the surface. And so anything that I do here is almost irrelevant, including the drain if I mess up somewhere. Because the surface, before I set any tile, is already waterproof. So why am I waterproofing and waterproofing? top and bottom, bottom and top. It's a CYA thing. I'm just used to doing a liner. You know, I theoretically could just put some wire mesh inside here and screed out the pan and all that stuff and then go forward with just waterproofing the surface, but I'm not comfortable doing that. So for my comfort level, I'm still gonna put a pan liner. But the reason I'm using this fleece material instead is because of this corner. When you have these little outside corners, it's always very, very difficult, as you saw before, to get a pan liner, traditional pan liner, to wrap around there without cutting it and somehow scabbing in something like they've tried before. It's a little easier, well, it's a lot easier to do that around here. But you can't really fasten this liner, this type of liner, without using thin set. So I'm going to screed out thin set along all this blocking and wood from that six inches down, kind of butter that whole area. And then when that's dry, I'll be able to like wrap up my liner and stick it to that with some thin set. And that's usually how I do it when I have metal studs or um, I'm doing the, the liner, mm, the fleece liner has a purpose. I don't do it all the time, maybe once or twice in a year, but it has a purpose and for this reason, that I just mentioned, that's why I'm doing it. Anyway, I'm not gonna go up three studs. I'm gonna keep it exactly where it was so that with any luck, all those holes for the shower door will line up. Um, I was tempted to go three up, but if I did that, then I would have to take off some more of this bull nose tile and I don't wanna mess with that. So I'm just gonna leave well enough alone. So the next step is I said, oh, and this is, see the water damage after I took out the liner. There's water damage everywhere because they didn't build a shower. They didn't know how to build a shower correctly. And to that point, there was a piece of blocking, a piece of two by four that was nailed to this. And I took it out because I need my blocking here. And voila, we have the original shower supply, hot and cold. So the shower head used to be here when it was the original shower. And as I mentioned the other day, they didn't know how to do tile, <laughs> which is why all of this is bumped out. Um, it's not a horrible job, but it's not a great job. And obviously it's never great when it leaks and it leaked. So there you go. 
So the blocking uh, will go in, as I said before, and yeah, all these are pre-cut, so I just gotta nail them in. I toe nail, I usually toe nail uh, three inch nails into the top, and I'm not gonna show that, but in this case, I'm gonna use uh, deck screws, three inch deck screws and toe nail from the top. When you run into pipes, which you always will, and the pipes are too far out, which they almost always are, then you just, you know, with my chop saw, I'm able to just like, yeah, take out some of that. And then it fits in there good. Um, if I had, if I had my hands on some three quarter or five eighths ply, I could just as easily cut a six inch piece of plywood. And I have a finished nailer, so I could finish nail, still toenail in here, or I can get some construction adhesive and like glue it in, but then I'd have to wait for that to dry. So, same thing goes for here. This pipe is kind of angled toward the back, so I angled my cut to kind of match it. And that's gonna go in there very nice and neatly. Um, and that's it. So that's the next process, and then of course I've gotta set my new grain. Um, the three-piece drain I'm still using, just FYI, OT makes this uh, drain, and there is another drain cap out there that's very flimsy. It's a it's an aluminum type of cap, and I don't like it. Uh, the grates are much larger, and it's really cheesy, and I don't like it. So I like this because it is like a brass, um, it is a stainless steel, it's heavy. It's probably twice or three times the weight of that other drain. So by default I get these. I think this is about $28, the other one is about $12. So it's about twice the price, but a much better drain. So I'm going to set that drain in there. I'm going to put in all the scabbing. I'm going to butter all that stuff. I'm going to get some wallboard, which I have. And the wallboard is going to... Um, oh, by the way, I'm using Triton, and you'll see that later on. Triton wallboard is pretty good. I like it. It scores and snaps and does all the things I want it to do um, as opposed to a cement backer board. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap the curb with the liner and all that stuff. And then tomorrow I'll come in with the backer board. Yeah, because I still have to put my pan liner up and all that stuff. So it's a process. It takes typically when I do one of these shower pan redos, it's about five to six days from very beginning to very end. Normally, I'm doing some of this build back process the following day, but yesterday was so arduous getting all this material out of here that, you know, after about six, almost seven hours, I just kind of called it a day. So it's usually not that bad. Anyway, I'm going to get started. All right, here we get into the fleece material. I skipped a couple. All right, now we get into um, the pan material that I'm using. Uh, usually it's curdy. In this case, um, I'm not really sure what this material is. The tile place I went to had some extra of this fleece fabric material, which is basically the same as curdy. And what I'm doing is I'm, I'm doing a kind of dry fit uh, to figure out where I'm going to be setting at. And you see the thin set that's on uh, the 2x6 and the thin set that's at the bottom corner as well as a curb I had done the day before. Um, so I'm taking a sharpie and just kind of drawing out the lines of where this pan material is going to set later on. Just makes it easier to set once I start gluing it to the floor. And now I start gluing it to the floor. So let me back up. You see the thin set around the drain. You see the thin set that was on the 2x6s around the 2x4s and all that stuff. So. I'm screeding out that thin set the day before so it covers all the cracks between the 2x4s and the 2x6s and up the 2x4s at the curb. Um, and it facilitates the new thin set that I'm spreading on here uh, to adhere to it better than if it was just bare wood. And so I'm, I'm slathering it on kind of thick and then later on I'm going to take a, ha a quarter inch by quarter inch trowel and I'm gonna kind of like V-notch all of that thin set because um, I don't want a whole lot. When I put this uh, fleece material down, I have to push out the excess, so be careful not to have too much thin set. Um, otherwise, you'll be pushing out and po possibly ripping or tearing this material. And that's where I'm traveling out all the excess. 
before I set the fabric material. So, as I said, usually I use Curdy on applications where I need a fabric material as a tool because that's what it is. All material to me is a tool and it has a reason and a purpose for the particular job I'm doing. And on this job, because of that, that outside corner, uh, the guy before me struggled like struggled to get his rubber pan material uh, cut in such a way and patched in such a way for it to be waterproof and it wasn't. In fact both of those corners those outside corners uh, were the Achilles heel were the reason that this thing leaked and is the reason why I do the fabric material. I usually do this on a um, curbless shower and specifically on a concrete slab type of curbless shower because it's a thinner material that will stick to the outside floor whereas with a traditional pan liner it will not so it just fa facilitates uh, an easier uh, process for me to go around now you will so see later on that I'll have to put in little scab pieces in the same spots that he tried to put scab pieces of liner in but this works out better um, so yeah just kind of getting it as straight and flat and flush to everything as possible to begin with before I start pushing pushing it out so I'm using a um, couple of blades I'm using a margin trowel to kind of hold the material in place and then I'll use a six inch uh, taping knife um, to push out all the excess thin set and let me see what I'm going to be doing next. Yep, that's what I'm doing right here. So the corners, I'm usually uh, doing a hospital fold in the corners. In this case, I could have done, you see in that, that back left, well, right up at the top there, where the two 2x4s two come together, there is a gap there. And usually there's not. Usually it's like two 2x4s two or four of them put together, which precludes me from sticking that corner into that gap. But in this case, I could have done that. I could have cut out part of that 2x4 and made, made um, a larger gap and then pushed that corner into those two 2x4s. Two but in this case, I didn't. I used um, a fold, and then I stuck some thin set into the fold to kind of glue the fold together. And then you see here, I'm using... Um, my five inch or my six inch taping knife to uh, push all the excess thin set out and then here I'm just cutting right at the corner where the guy struggled before with the pan liner which is why I use this material on any outside corner application because it just makes my life so much easier so you just cut it down to the top of the curb uh, you'll end up with that gap and that gap will get filled in later on with an, another piece of material. Also, um, this fabric wasn't large enough to get off to that right over there. That right side is going to be scabbed in with another another sheet. I think there'll be like a six inch overlap on the other part of that. And all of my overlaps, all of my seams will get waterproof later on. I think in this case I'm using Ardex but um, I don't trust Thinset to be a waterproofer as Schluter Curdy likes to purport and for that reason alone I always 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 want to use a uh, fabric material like this all my seams all the places where water could possibly penetrate um, I always overlap with a liquid topical membrane also uh, the excess material that's hanging over the curb I'm not gluing to the outside of the curb. There's really no point. Um, water is not going to see the outside of the curb, although I think I waterproof it with the Ardex later on just for kicks and giggles, but um, I just cut off the excess at this point. Yeah, once this the whole process is done, um, then I wait overnight and let that dry before I pour my pan. Here I'm cutting off the excess. And then I use some of that excess material to fill in those gaps. You'll see on that top right corner there where the 2x4s are. And um, right there at that 22 and a half corner. 
um, I'll scab in a piece there as well as the inside on that um, where the two pieces of uh, I'm going to call it liner where the two pieces of the liner come together now it's argued that why do I need to go through all this process if I'm going to be waterproofing the pan surface anyway which I do so why do you need the shower pan why do you need all this stuff um, it's CYA there's no harm no foul and I would rather go through this process and guarantee to my customer that they will never ever have a leak than to mess up maybe possibly on the pan surface with my waterproofer and then have nothing below it to take up you know any slack and so that's why I do this it's a slight redundancy that I'm very comfortable with doing and there's where you saw I scabbed in on that corner and here's where I'm scabbing in on, on uh, where the 2x4s come together and this corner is usually the Achilles heel of every shower and that's why they make the dam corners with the PVC membrane um, that I could have bypassed this and put wall, wall board directly over that and then I waterproof the wall board and the curb and no water would ever see that corner true enough but I had the time and I had the material and I had the ability to do uh, this piece of material so I did it and it works and now I move on to me talking even more about what I've just done it is all taken care of now it is Pretty, 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 pretty solidly waterproof, but I never trust this material. I never trust thin set. Um, there's an overlap of about four inches across here, across there. Uh, there's an overlap over here because I ran out of There's a lot of angles here, and because of all the angles, I had to scab in a piece across the top. So there's about two or three inch overlap on both of those end to end to take up for the difference in the middle. And then there's a triangular cut that I had to make, and it goes up the wall, or sorry, it goes up the curb a little bit. And so there's there's a redundancy. Oh, is that a, a leaf? There's a redundancy a little bit. Because I want to make sure that it is solidly waterproof. Having said that, because I don't trust the overlap, everywhere there's an overlap, um, it's going to get... Ooh, I like this artifice. It's a gray, it's a gray type, it looks green, doesn't it? But it's a gray type substance that I use in another job and I have extra, so I'm going to use it on here. It's going to go on the wall board as well. But everywhere there's an overlap of material, right there, right there, everywhere, including here, including there. Yeah, it's going to get a liquid topical membrane on top of that. I didn't bother wa waterproofing the curb all the way um, to the outside because the outside is never going to see water but I probably will when I'm doing the overlap with the waterproofer I'll still waterproof that since I've already screwed it up and set onto it and yeah so by the time uh, tomorrow comes around and this is waterproof with my liquid topical membrane it is a functional shower the way it is then my mortar is see my mortar I love this sand mix. This is a Lowe's product, uh, Sacrete. Um, it just works a lot better for me than the Home Depot product that I used to get. So when at all possible, I always use this and I have more than enough. It'll only take probably four bags, maybe three and a half. But better to have it and not need it than to need it, need it and not have it. Um, so tomorrow, after the waterproofing phase, I'll put the wall board up. The wall board will get screeded with thin set it will get waterproofed and then um sorry my bad i'll do the pan first then the next day i'll do the wall board and the waterproofing and the waterproofing will be contiguous onto the floor and onto the wall board everywhere um, so that it's functional before i even start the tile process so about three more days about three to four more days this is normally about a five to six day job so this is going to bump into six days easy. But that's it. I'm out of here for the day. Well, everything is dry. Next day, I'm using Ardex. I have this from a previous job. 
and I just like it a lot. I'm not concerned about this corner. There was no cut made. But why not? This is what I'm concerned about. Overlap. Overlap is not good. Fence set is not waterproof. Never has been, never will be. So the overlap always gets it. And I'm probably going to do it twice. Yeah. Makes more sense to me. And, um, enough experiments have been done to show on Curdy how this can fail. And so I'm adherent to making sure that I don't have a failure. And for that reason, I always, always, always do an overlap waterproofing. No reason not to. It takes all of 10 minutes. And true enough, the surface is going to be waterproofed. So it's a bit of redundancy but it's one I'm comfortable with. And um, yeah, so there's really no point in going through every single little area on video. Quite obvious what I'm doing. So I'm just going to um, sign off for right now get back to my focus oh that's it I think that's it I'll do a little bit of that when in question when in question just just do it I think that's it that's all the overlap there is ah. Again, I don't anticipate that this side sees any water ever, ever, ever. But since I'm here anyway, since I still have to wait for this to dry be between coats, then it's like, okay, why not? Let me go ahead and spend another few minutes on this outside portion. And by the way, if you have to slop it, slop it somewhere other than where you need it, don't try and take it off right away. Just wait till it dries. It's easier to take it off when it dries and when it's wet. Yeah. I think I got one right here. Yeah, that's about it. about maybe 30 minutes or so with a fan on it it'll dry out pretty quickly it's already drying out right there and then I'll come back do it again
Well, I have the pan already done. Looking very, very nice. A little broom up to the drain. Tomorrow that will get a bead of silicone. And then the waterproofing will overlap that silicone. Um, level on both sides, front to back, sideways. Um, I drew a line. Um, you can see the Sharpie. I drew a line with a, uh, I think it was a one by all the way around the perimeter and that worked off of that. There are different ways to do it. I have a different, and the reason I didn't show this is because I have a different video. I think it'll be right there that I'll post. There's a link and you can watch that on how to do a pan. But yeah, it takes about an hour, more or less. Depends on the size and all that stuff, but it is ready. Um, I'll let this dry and then tomorrow I'll come back. I'll do the wall board, do all the mudding on the wall board and with any luck do the waterproofing on the wall board. Maybe not, I don't know. Maybe the next day I'll wait. I usually like to let my pan stay for about three days to dry out, more or less. If I get into the second day and I have to waterproof it, then so be it. But yeah, it is almost done into day four. It is the next day and my pan looks so, so nice. This is the way it should be. I got a lot of emails and phone calls and stuff like that where people say the next day, you know, my, my shower pan is sandy and I sweep it up and it's still sandy and I don't know what's going on and what should I do? Should I do it over? I'm like, whew, I don't know. I don't know how to speak to that because I don't run into that. If you use the proper amount of water, which I think most people are trying to do the so-called so dry pack, I think where they're messing up is they're not erring on the side of caution by using enough water. Because there's no harm, no foul, right? If you use a little bit too much water, then not enough. It's still going to dry. It's still going to do what it's supposed to do. You know, all the chemical reaction is going to happen with the cement and all that stuff. If you don't use enough water, how can the chemical reaction happen? It can't. Then you're going to end up with a sandy pan. I don't know. And I don't know the product that you use either. You know, what you saw yesterday, the Satcrete, that's what I like. It's, it's at uh, Florin, sorry, it's at Lowe's. I don't use Satcrete on every pan. Sometimes I, you know, I'm shopping at Home Depot, so I use the mortar mix, um, the yellow bag with the red stripe. I know I said green stripe in the past because the green stripe you can, you know, like knock off some high spots if you have it the next day. With the red stripe, you won't be able to do that. It's very hard, solid, like this is, and there's nothing you can do. Which is why I advocate for a homeowner to use the green stripe one rather than the red stripe. I use the red stripe because I'm. When I do all my screening and all that stuff, as I did yesterday, I know it's as perfect as I can possibly get it, so I don't need that playroom. Anyway, I'm gonna get on to the silicone. As many of you know, I make my own waterproof pan, and mm, the water in, water out system, and the pre-slope and all that stuff doesn't apply anymore. But the only way you can do that, you know, when I get questions where the pan material meets your shower pan liner, should I run some caulking along that? I'm like, why? Because you're pushing red guard in between that. So the red guard is going to stick to the, both the rubber and the mortar. You could do the caulking? I don't see the point. So I specifically only caulk around here because this is the other Achilles heel of where water could possibly get in. So I'm going to run, and then I'm going to go off camera, I'm going to run a little bead of caulking if I have any left. I don't have any oh there it goes um, and then I'm gonna kind of like push it into the mortar and up along the side with my finger but I'll do that off camera but yeah just get it up under there the best you can and then make sure you push it in there screen it out and you'll be good to go and then let that dry but so while that's drying while that's hardening up and everything I'm gonna start cutting wallboard and fashioning that in so get busy on this
I am back after all the waterproofing has cured for two days actually because I left on a Saturday and it is now Monday. So it looks very nice and very waterproof and exactly the way I want it. So I want to throw a couple things out there. Mm, the hexagon tile is becoming so redundant. It's like every job we're doing, we're doing hexagon. So what I've learned is it's a lot easier on these end pieces right here instead of like the half little diamond thing or a little cut in is to cut that off. So cut those off and cut off all the other ends because these ends are up against the wall. Cut those off with your wet saw. Then do a dry fit. Sorry, back password. Do a dry fit first. Find out where your tile is going to land everywhere. Um, I don't pay attention to the drain because everything is predicated on the back, wherever the tile is going to end. And so that's what I do anyway. If you had square tile, yeah, I guess you, and a square drain, yeah, I guess you could focus on the drain, but I don't. So pre-plan, dry fit your tile first and cut off your excess ends. And then you can go forward from there. And that's what I'm going to do. Mix up the thin set and get started. Well, two to three hours later, more or less, I'm done with this floor. All the way up to the edges, all the way around. I do a little taper cut. I don't know if I'm the only one that does it, but I've been doing it for forever. A little taper cut on each one of those pieces going around. So it's slightly above the drain cap. I just like that better. I just believe that it helps in evacuation of the water, positive water flow. So anyway, I'm gonna put a fan on this overnight. Tomorrow I will wrap this first thing. Wait about an hour, hour and a half with a fan on it to set up and then I will get to the wall tile. And then basically done. Well, maybe the curb too. Wall tile, the curb, curb top, cut that, set it in there and then I might have to come back tomorrow to grout. Sorry, the next day to grout. Yeah, so that is a shower pan redo. Waterproof, never have a problem forever and ever. So it's a day later. My customer decided to use these instead of straight, which I kind of wanted a diagonal which was an option. I just didn't want it as an option because it took a lot more cuts and a lot more work. But I followed the pattern in that corner and the top and all that stuff. So following the pattern in the corners just makes it look like it was meant to be. Like we did it that way. Then I put the curb top on, the inside tile, outside tile. Um, I didn't raise the curb as I had talked about, so it's the same basically the same setup that it was before, except it's one solid curb top. But yeah, that's it. A little longer than I anticipated. A little foot shelf in the corner per my customer's request. Um, then tomorrow I'm gonna grout. Let that sit up and I'll be done. I missed a lot of steps on this, but it is finished. It is good to go. Uh, basically the way it was, except different, the contiguous curb top, flush with the outside and the inside, um, with the 45 cut on it. The shower door should match up where all those holes were and all that stuff, but we gotta go a glass guy to come in here and do that. Um, the new tile on the floor, octagon, hexagon, sorry, hexagon what seems to be all the rave, although this is um, a marble hexagon. Um, the 16 by 16 that I got, my customer decided, we were trying to do the math to get it, like some tile, I would, um, how would I put this? Like that cut up there would replicate down there, but then every cut would be in line with the grout line, which would have worked. Mm, a little different, but it would have worked. And then, he decided he wanted that on a diagonal, which I was pushing back against because it's, oof, it's a lot of work to get that on the diagonal. But we wanted to make it look like it was meant to be, like it was a design feature. Um, have the drain, new drain cap, better one than what, that little cheesy one that was here before. 
I do my cuts on these tile at a taper. So there's positive water flow going into the drain. I do that on all of them. I don't like that cut. That one's kind of funky. But yeah, bench is gone. Um, she wanted a footstool put in there. So that worked out very well, nice and sloped. Um, a little bit of boo-boo on this tile when I was doing the tear out. Uh, I got rid of some of the glaze there, but I'm gonna put a little touch up paint there. Uh, yeah, but uh, everything is put back and uh, functional now. Even the diagonal, diagonal follows even around the corner with the cuts and stuff like that. Upside down cut. But yeah, that's how you do a shower pan redo when you don't have a choice. This is actually taking a lot longer than normally. Um, normally it's about a five to six day job. This took about seven to eight days because of the complexity of some of the things going on here. But otherwise, yeah, it beats taking out. There's no reason to take out all of this stuff and redo it. There is no reason. All of your failure happens ankle below. Ankle below was all your failure on almost every shower with some exceptions but for the most part yeah so this is my first one for the year i think it's april yeah first one for the year i'll probably do one or two more before the year is gone but yeah um as best a match as we could get mm, it kind of looks like i don't know what do you guys think put it in the comments section if 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 this looks like oh it was meant to be all of this was meant to be that way it was built this way yeah i'd like to know that because that's kind of what we were looking for there's a little shade difference but i don't think it's a big deal anyway i'm out of here and on to the next job shower the door guy does it you know what i could have put all that stuff back together but look at all that stuff oh my goodness i don't get i stay in my lane i don't do glass don't like it and don't do it Hey, if you enjoyed that video and you learned something, consider being a Patreon member. Five, ten, fifteen dollars a month would help me greatly produce more videos. I make nothing from YouTube at all. If you're going to call me for advice, please donate fifty dollars for thirty minutes. My link to my PayPal and my Patreon account is down below. And if you haven't already, hit the subscribe button and hit the bell so you get immediate notifications as soon as I post videos. And thank you very much for your support.